Hare Krishna. Anyway, we have. If anybody calls me, we get knocked off phone. Om Gyanati Nirandasya Gyanam Jana Shalakaya Chaksuro Militam Jena Tasmai Sri Gurave Namaha Sri Chaitana Marobishtam Stapitam Yena Bhutale Shayam Rupa Gadamayam Dadati Shapadantikam You all understand English? So, this class will help you understand something more deeply about the Leelas of Krishna and um, also about the heart of Krishna. Now, on the day that Krishna was punished, it was Diwali. And so by his own arrangement, there is a festival that everyone had gone to in his kingdom and in the village. So Krishna had arranged that. Or it was arranged by Yogamaya because if Mother Yasoda tried to tie up Krishna, no one would allow it. And the only way it could be possible was if everybody was gone. So the pastime is, is being planned out and the arrangements are being made. And that was one of the arrangements, that everybody would be gone. And when everybody's gone, then it's possible for Jasoda to tie up Krishna. So that, that was also <coughs> part of Krishna's arrangement, because he's, he knows how the pastime is going to be carried out. But as we discussed yesterday, but then he goes into the Leela and he forgets himself. So in the Leela, when his mother was chasing him, he was running towards the gate of the compound to go outside thinking that she would not punish him outside he was afraid of the stick, remember? She had a stick, and she had never carried a stick before. And that was Nana Maharaj's walking stick that, that she just picked up spontaneously. So now she's coming after him with a stick, and he's frightened. So he runs to go outside the gate, thinking there'll be people outside on the road, and therefore, she can't punish him. But he had already arranged and forgotten that there wouldn't be people. So it shows how when he goes into the Leela, he forgets. So it was his arrangement. So he could be punished and tied up. So that was part of the Leela. Um, another interesting thing, do you find that interesting? When Krishna, he knows and he doesn't know. And he knows when he needs to know, and he doesn't know when he doesn't need to know. When it helps the Leela, he doesn't know. When it helps the Leela, he knows. So everything, when we say it helps the Leela, it just means it's increasing the love and affection. Right? It's just like the, um, the perversion in the material world is that a man and a woman will go somewhere which is called romantic. What does romantic mean? It means a place which would increase your love, like a full moon night walk on the beach. Like now, I used to live in South Africa. If you go to South Africa, now it's November, it's starting to get warm, it's summer. And if you go in the summer on the beach at night, it's warmer than it is here. It's almost as warm as the day. And you're walking with this nice warm breeze, full moon night, and the beautiful flowers there are very fragrant. So you, if you're walking with your lover, then you would say it's romantic, right? 
that everything in the atmosphere is increasing your feelings of love. So whenever we say what Krishna is doing to enhance the pastime, it means he's doing things that will increase the love, both his love and his devotee's love. Now, something very unusual happens, and it's a huge paradox. As we said, when Yashoda showed the stick, Krishna was very afraid of it. And then Yashoda, he was so afraid that when Yashoda ran to grab him, to punish him, because he had done something really bad and she wanted there to be some consequence, because he had stolen all this butter and she wanted to teach him a lesson that you can't steal. If you steal, you're going to be punished. And she didn't know. She wasn't planning to tie him up. She didn't know how she was going to punish him. But she had to get him, grab him. And when he saw that stick, and she went to get him, he ran. And he wouldn't let her catch him. And as fast as she ran, he was always this far ahead of her. And at one point, he turned around and said, that stick, you're not going to use that stick, are you? She said, surrender. You're a thief, and you need to be punished. And he kept asking about the stick. Well, what about the stick? He was frightened by the stick. And she said, he said, I'll surrender if you throw the stick away. So she said, OK, I'll throw it away. But she just put it behind her back. And then he started running again. And he would look back to see her. And this is his mother. And there's so much affection coming from her. He's so attracted by her that when he looks at her, he's overcome by her love, but he's trying to get away from her. So yesterday we said how, how Yashoda is <coughs> subdued by, that Krishna is subdued by Mother Yashoda's love, right? And he was subdued by her milk products, because when he eats the milk products, he feels her love. And then he comes under the control of her love, right? You know about being under the control of love? We've all experienced the love of our mother or the love of somebody. <coughs> so he didn't want to eat her milk products because he thought he would be controlled by her because of her love. <coughs> so now he's running away from her, and he looks back to see where she is. And by looking back, there's all this love coming towards him. And he's thinking, if I look back too much, it's going to pacify my anger. And then if I become pacified, she's going to catch me, and then she's going to punish me. So he wouldn't look back at her too much, because he, he knows He'll get caught, and he doesn't want to get caught, and he doesn't want to get punished. And as we said, he was afraid of the stick. The stick was really frightening him, and he kept asking her, the stick, but you're not going to use that stick, are you? He keeps asking her, you know. She says, stop, stop running, you rascal. You're not going to use the stick, are you? Because he's debating whether he should stop or keep running, right? So then... Something very interesting happens, which shows, which gives an insight into Krishna's Leela. He's very frightened by that stick, and he's very frightened by the consequence of the stealing. He doesn't exactly know what his mother's going to do, but he's frightened that she's going to do something, whatever it is. And 
he's trying to feign or pretend that he didn't do anything. I, I didn't steal it. It's not my fault. You know, he's, this is his plan. He's going to argue his way out of this because he's really afraid of being punished. So while this Leela is going on, there's a contradictory emotion going on. It's that he's angry because he wasn't fed. And he's frightened by the stick and potential chastisement. But at the same time, this is all his mother's affection. Her anger is her affection. Right? And she's thinking, out of love, I have to discipline him. Because if I don't, he'll keep, he'll keep stealing. Right? Because she just sees him as his son. So her anger is pure love. Like we say when a child's being punished, it's going to hurt me more than it's going to hurt you. You're going to hit the child or punish him. This is going to hurt me more than it's going to hurt you. And then, wow, you hit them. Or you make them stay in their room, or you do something, don't give them dinner, or whatever. Right? This is going to hurt me more than it's going to hurt you. So, um, out of love, Maria Soda is chasing him. And she's angry. So Krishna is feeling fear of being chastised, but he's feeling this other emotion. And it's like, it's hard. He doesn't know which way to go. He's feeling simultaneously the love of his mother in the anger. So there's this duality going on. Interesting, right? You understand? He's feeling the anger and he's frightened. He's rubbing his eyes. He's crying. As we said yesterday, he cried an ocean of tears. Yoga Maya came, she dried it up. So Madhya Soda wouldn't understand who he was. And um, he was also crying because he was caught <coughs> red handed. We say, do you understand? Use that word, caught red handed. <coughs> that means you're caught in the act of doing something. And, you know, he's thinking, I'm going to try to defend myself, flee innocent, but he can't. So, he's so frightened. In the Dhammarashtra, he said his pearl necklace was shaking, right? Because he was shivering in fright. Isn't that what it says in the song? Does it use the word shivering? Do you remember? Shaking? Yeah. He was shaking out. He was so afraid he was shaking. Mother Yasoda is there. What's she going to do? And then it even got doubly worse because he ran out. He was thinking, like, what? A, is this going to be like such an embarrassment? My friends will see me being punished. Everybody will see. My reputation will be ruined. Like, I'm guilty. They had this emotion going on. And so, so these were the real emotions of that three-year-old. And he's shaking, 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 completely frightened, begging his mother not to use the stick. And then she's negotiating with him. You know, you, you know you're a thief. You have to be punished. I won't use the stick. And then he doesn't know what to do because he can't defend himself. So it said he cried and rubbed his eyes. At that point, that was his defense. Because he thought if he just cries and rubs his eyes, then, you know, when a child cries enough, you don't want to punish them. Right? Yes? How do you say yes in German? No. Yeah. Yeah? yeah. yeah? Huh? Ya? Da? Si? Chinese? Sure. Sure. That's easy. 
And in Australia and New Zealand, how do you say yes? Yes. Yep. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> South Africa, yeah. Kind of good. So, yes. Well, the Acharyas have commented on that. And they said, he was actually crying. But now, he's, when they say fake tears, he's like making more. He's, so here he's making more because his only defense now is his tears. Because he can't, he has no defense. He's been caught. But the Acharyas say he definitely was crying. But in order to have some defense, he was faking more tears and making more happen. Right? Yeah. Yes. What they, the way they say it, it was just more tears. So they were real tears, but he made more tears. <laughs> so some of them were fake, false. You know, just, but he, he was actually crying. But specifically now, when he's caught, then he's, this is how he's defending himself, hoping she won't punish him because of his fake tears. I mean, not because of his tears. She doesn't know they're fake. And you know, they're different. Different acharyas have they write different commentaries on the Lila. So their interpretation of fake is not always the same. But that's general consensus, at least, that he was crying. He was just adding more tears. Oh yeah, Cha can make fake tears too. Yeah, certainly for Krishna, it's not a problem. And why do they make fake tears? That they're not to. It's their defense, right? And it's also, Prabhupada said that's a woman's defense also, her last weapon. Seventy-five percent of. Oh, it's. Physiological or psychological? There's no cause. Oh. So physiological means what? Their state of mind. No. Um, yeah, anyway, this was Krishna's weapon. Anyway, Brother Yasoda convinced him that he's not going to use the stick, it's not going to be that bad. And she couldn't catch him unless Krishna allowed her to. So this whole race is going on right out of the courtyard. And he always kept, no matter how fast she ran, he always kept an arm's length, and then she was getting tired. And then there was some negotiation, as I said, and they were talking and then started running, and that gave her a little rest. And, but anyway, it, you know, the, the demigods are looking at this, and they're thinking, this is, like, amazing. But as we know... Finally, Krishna agreed to be caught. And, you know, there's two pastimes here where one, he agrees to be caught, and one, he agrees to be tied up. But until he agrees, he's not caught and he's not tied up. He has to agree. Right? So, 
finally agrees, and then she grabs his hand. She holds, she just grabs his wrist, and she holds on. Because she has the stick in her other hand. Anyway, and then she didn't know what she was going to do, and she was thinking, he's really in a bad mood, he's really angry, and he's really mischievous. And I have things to do, and if I just leave him, he's going to do his mischief again. So I will tie him up, and this thought just came to her, I will tie him up, so he can't do any more mischief. And of course, he doesn't want to be tied up, and she's explaining, look at what you've done. You think you can do this and get away with no punishment or light punishment? There's no way. You've done something really bad, and you're going to pay for it. And I have to be sure you don't do it again, so I'll tie you up. Okay? But as I said, Krishna agreed to be caught. And what was he caught by? He's only controlled by what? His mother's love. So he was caught by his mother's love. That's all. And when the love overwhelms him, or he feels pity on his mother, and she's running so hard, and she's so fatigued, or whatever, he doesn't want to see his mother suffer. So then he agrees. Right? And then he says, okay. I'll let her catch me. But that was only half of it. So now he's caught. Then she gets this idea, we'll tie him up. Now she has to tie him up. And there's no rope, so she pulls out whatever's in her hair and ties her hair, which was actually long enough. And the mortar is there. Um, I forget exactly how, what happened, but a rope was tied around it. And then she was going to tie another rope around his waist and tie a knot to that rope. And the mortar was quite heavy. She was certain that the mortar is heavy enough that he could never move it. So he can't do anything. So he'll be stable. That's his punishment. So as you know the story, Ropes were coming. And uh, there was never enough rope. And everybody thought it was kind of funny. Because they knew Krishna was special. And he always did like special things. You know, like whenever <coughs> he did something amazing, everybody, and they didn't really know who he was. Maybe it's, uh, occasionally they'd say maybe he's Narayan or empowered by Narayan or he's a demigod or a mystic or something. They, they couldn't really figure it out, but it didn't really matter to them because they loved him so much. And so when this Leela was going on, everybody was kind of laughing. They thought it was amusing because they knew that he was like playing with his money. I mean, imagine if you were there and you're watching this Leela, that money is sort of getting all these ropes and getting more ropes and getting more ropes. And no matter how many ropes she has, somehow the ropes shrink to the same size, which is probably like this big. And you have like 25 feet of rope, you take it, and then it's like you know, a foot and a half, or a, a third of a meter, or a half a meter. Isn't that weird? You know, every time you're tying the rope, it's two fingers too short. That means the rope's shrunk, right? How else would that happen? It has to just, if it's too short, it's too short, right? Here's a long rope, and we tie it up, and then it's two fingers too short. So everybody's watching this thinking, this is like really funny. And they're kind of laughing because they're saying Krishna's playing a joke. But of course... Mother Yasoda is in the mood of the mother, and she's angry. And she's totally in the mood of, this boy has to be punished. Right? Isn't it? That's her bob, that's her meditation. 
Like, it's like there's that Leela where someone tried to convince Nanda Maharaj that Krishna was God. And he said, I don't care if he's God. He's my son and I'll punish him because he's doing mischief. So that bob takes place. That just overcomes, overshadows everything. Even if someone tries to tell you your son is God, like, whatever, who cares? I'm going to punish him, he's my son. So, so from the time that Krishna was put down, stole the butter, Mother Yasoda went in the kitchen, fed the monkeys, ran from Mother Yasoda throughout the courtyard, to, out through the gates, finally caught, and Mother Yasoda gathering all the rope, that took most of the day. Most of the better part of the day that was going on. It wasn't like, you know, when you look at it, you might think, well, that must have taken 15 minutes. No, it took most of the day for all of that to happen. So, now there's some interesting, one very interesting point that comes out of the story and it's something that I think we all think about, probably not in relation to the story, but why Krishna sometimes makes it so hard to be Krishna conscious. Like we, we, we're trying really hard, but it seems like we're getting, we're not making much progress. You ever feel like that? Like it's not happening fast enough, or I wish it would happen faster, or Krishna, haven't I tried hard enough? When will you... What else can I do? I've done everything. And still, I don't feel like my problems are gone. I don't feel that I have enough attraction for you. So that's what the two fingers short is demonstrating. She sort of was trying all day to bind him, and she couldn't. And Krishna wouldn't let her. So it didn't matter. It's like for us, if Krishna doesn't show us mercy, it doesn't matter how hard you try or what you do. It doesn't. Because he has to show it. So it doesn't matter if your rope's long enough. He won't let, if he don't let you bind him, he won't let you bind him. So, you know, sometimes you chant really good rounds and at the whole morning program and you're doing sincere service. And you still feel like it's not, I'm not getting Krishna consciousness the way I want to get it. Because you can't force it. It's up to Krishna. He has to give it. Uh, there was one devotee, and he had left Prabhupada and taken shelter of another guru. And that guru said, you can't get love of Krishna unless you chant 64 rounds a day. And that devotee told Prabhupada that he was chanting 64 rounds a day. And he actually told that to Prabhupada, that you can't get love of Krishna unless you chant 64 rounds a day. It's kind of a crazy madness to tell your spiritual master, or now, I guess, to your former spiritual master, more or less, that you will not get love of Krishna, or no one will get love of Krishna. I mean, he could have meant that Prabhupada's disciples won't get love of Krishna. But that's still a crazy thing to tell Prabhupada. Like, you're making a mistake. So Prabhupada was with his disciples, and he said something more or less to the effect that even if you chant a hundred rounds a day, you can't force, that can't be, you can't force Krishna to give you love. He has to give it to you. So it's not just because you do something, Krishna is forced to say, okay, now you get it. 100 rounds a day, now you get it. It's not like that. So you say, unless you do this, you won't get love of Krishna. In, in, in some sense, there's truth to that, but you have to understand how that works. That you do it, and then Krishna says, okay. And until he says, okay, that means either you're doing the wrong thing, or he wants you to keep doing what you're doing more or better. Yeah. 
He makes it difficult. Well, there's an, I'll tell you another story. But you may have heard these stories before. But, but like we understand, it said that Krishna won't give love easily because he's controlled by it. Just like, just like even in this world, if you have a relationship with the opposite sex, maybe you're dating, or maybe you're getting to know them, and you might think, I'm a little cautious, because if I spend too much time with them, I'll get attached. If I get attached, I'll get controlled by that attachment. Right? So you might, you might tell the person, uh, I don't want to see you that much. Even though you like them, you might say, I don't want to see you that much. Because you kind of feel like if I do, the attachment's going to go stronger, and I want my freedom. And I know if I become attached to you, I lose my freedom. Right? That's, that does happen. So Krishna, he's a little bit like that. So that's one aspect of it, that, that he's careful who he gives love to. In other words, he's not going to allow himself to be controlled by someone who's not qualified to be controlled by. Like, like let's say right now Krishna gave all of us love, but we're not really qualified to have the love. So now Krishna's controlled by all of us, and we might be, okay, where's my BMW? Okay, where's my husband? Where's my wife? Where, you know, we might be controlling Krishna in the wrong way, and he may not be ready to be controlled by us that way, right? Does that make sense? So there's also another aspect which Prabhupada explained is that although this seems contrary, it, in many ways mercy is actually earned. Because the mercy produces a result. And if mercy produces a result of elevated Krishna consciousness, but you're not ready for that elevated Krishna consciousness, then Krishna has to withhold mercy because that mercy might push you to a point where you can't handle it. And now you might think, well, if I get mercy to advance, then if I'm advanced, I can handle it. But Vishwanath Chakrabarti Thakur explains that there are anarthas that come as a byproduct of bhakti. And what is an anartha that comes as a byproduct? Well, it may not be anartha if you're on a more elevated stage, but if you're on a lower stage and you advance, begin to advance, you become honored. And the honor becomes an anartha for you because if you're not advanced enough, you can't deal with it. So if Krishna gives you mercy to the point where people start honoring you, but you're not able to handle it, then it means you're not able to handle the mercy. So he won't give you more mercy than you can handle, even though you want a lot of mercy. Krishna, give me mercy, give me all you can give. Perhaps a better prayer is, Krishna, give me all the mercy I can handle, or Krishna, help me advance so I can handle more mercy. You know, sometimes mercy may come in a way we're not ready to handle it. So a nice prayer is, please empower me or enable me to handle whatever mercy you're willing to give me. Right? So part of that struggle that we feel where we're not getting the mercy is Krishna saying, well, you become more qualified to receive it, then I'll give it. And so I need to see that you struggle more. And as you struggle, I take sympathy on you. And just as you saw that, that's what happened. There was a certain point, Krishna said, my mother's been struggling all day. I don't want to see her struggle anymore. She's trying really hard. OK, I will allow her to be bound by me. So in the same way, Krishna might say to you, OK, I know you want this mercy. And I see you're really trying for it, and you're really sincere. OK, I'm going to give it. Yes? Yeah, I've got a question. Krishna will provide the excuses for why he's not. 
say that again? That is um, a story Prabhupada told, a wealthy man. I believe the story was that he was a very wealthy man, and he was either an artist or he had trained his sons to be artists, or he trained them in an occupation. And he didn't give them any money in inheritance. He gave it elsewhere, perhaps a charity or something. He was asked why, and he said, because what I did was, I taught them how to earn a living, and if I gave them the money, they would have just, they would have spoiled them. You know, like Nala Kuvera Mani Griva, they got spoiled. So it's something like that. But, you know, you can also pray to Krishna, please give me the ability so I can be trusted with your mercy. Right? And yes, the other point that Prabhupada had said many, many times when he was asked, why doesn't your movement have a lot of followers? Because apparently there were other movements, you know, obviously long-standing religious movements with hundreds of thousands of followers, and, and Prabhupada's movement didn't have that many. And Prabhupada always said, because it's like a diamond, and for diamonds there are less purchasers. And, and Prabhupada said that I would prepare to not make one disciple, but I would never compromise the principle to make disciples. So Prabhupada is extending the same principle of Krishna. You have to be qualified, and when you're qualified, then you'll get the mercy. And so, a lot of times, the difficulty, or the, because there's difficulty, it makes us stronger. I was reading today that Srila Bhakti Siddhanta said that so often it's the difficulties that are the thing that make us advance more than anything. Because it draws us to Krishna more intensely and it causes us to pray. And of course, nobody wants difficulties. But if Krishna feels we need it, and sometimes instead of getting what we might define as mercy according to our conception, we get difficulty. But from Krishna's perspective, that difficulty was the mercy we needed. Or uh, one of the things I've noticed with devotees in Japa, probably one of the reasons, the biggest reason or most fundamental reason Japa is not good is because Devotee doesn't care enough to chant good japa. They just they don't put the effort out. And that's true of anything. Anything in your life which isn't good enough, it's probably you don't care that much that it's good enough. <clears throat> At least you don't care enough to make the effort that's required to make it good enough. I think you could go apply that to anything. You can apply it to your work, you can apply it to relationships, you can apply it to your sadhana, anything. Does that make sense? It's generally, you know, generally, let's say I'm counseling a couple and they don't have a good relationship. Most of the time it's because they don't really care if it's good. It's not that important to them. You know. As long as I get three meals a day, you know, and there's a roof over our head, that's good enough for me. There's enough money and so that inevitably will create a bad relationship because you don't care to make it any better, right? So when we're doing our sadhana and we're not advancing to the level we want to advance, the idea is Krishna's making it not so easy so we try harder because only by trying harder will we make advancement. And then Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur said, he said, actually, the way you get mercy is by trying harder. Not just by, not only by praying for mercy, 
but endeavoring for mercy. And I think some of us don't realize that's how we get mercy, because we think mercy is a gift, and how can you endeavor for a gift? But actually, these are the words of Srila Bhaktivedanta, that you endeavor for mercy. And if you don't make the endeavor, you don't get the mercy. And if you don't get the mercy, you don't advance. So you're not advancing by your own effort. You're advancing by mercy, but your effort is getting you the mercy. And I don't think everybody understands that. Of course, Krishna can give mercy how and when he wants. But this is a general procedure. That it's your effort. Backed by your, your, your effort, your desire is manifested in your effort. Not that you desire, but there's no effort. Oh, Krishna, I just want to attend Mangalarti every day. But you don't set an alarm, you stay up late at night. It's not a line. And until there's a desire to have good sadhana, good japa, and the accompanying effort, it doesn't happen. But it's like whatever happens is whatever ha If you don't make the effort, whatever happens is whatever happens. You have a good day, a bad day, it's more accidental than intention. So Krishna wants us to make it intentional. So that difficulty in advancing is the very thing that intensifies our desire to advance. And of course Krishna knows that better than we do. And Krishna wants to see us, he doesn't want to see us suffer, and I, I don't want to say he wants to see us struggle, but I only say that he wants to see us struggle because he knows that struggle is good for us. But the other thing is, when you make that struggle, he rewards you. So then you realize everything I'm saying is true, because it's not an endless struggle. You know, it's not like, you will have to struggle for 43 years before you'll see any mercy. No, you struggle, you'll see it. You may not see it tomorrow, but you'll see it soon. Right? What wave of the next struggle? Is yeah. Um, well, that depends on the individual. It depends on the individual. And it also depends on how the individual processes the struggle. Because in the, in the Bhagavatam, it says, there's a verse, I think it's 11th canto, it says, my suffering is not from my karma, it's not from other people, it's not from situations, it's not from this, it's not from that. So it's even not my karma. It's that net. It's the mind. So when you read that verse, you realize that the suffering is just how you perceive it, how the mind perceives it. Right? So sometimes we perceive something as a struggle, and then it becomes a struggle. You know? Have you ever said something that, that you're doing something and you say, this is so difficult? And that reinforces how difficult it is. And then it, then it be, appears to you to be more difficult. And someone else might say, that's not difficult. You have no idea. You want to know what difficult is. I can show you what difficult is. You should see what I've gone through. So relative, relatively speaking, what you think is difficult to them is not difficult. And so it's just how they're seeing it. So they're not suffering. So that's also a factor that plays into so-called suffering or difficulty is how we perceive it. And that if you perceive the difficulty as something that was bringing you closer to Krishna, then you wouldn't really call it suffering. You'd call it mercy. Wouldn't you? At least that's what Bhakti Siddhanta said. He said, that's actually what it is because it's bringing you closer to Krishna. And the, the um, tendency of the conditioned soul <coughs> is so strongly um, inclined for sense gratification that sometimes in the suffering what happens is Krishna's causing suffering and in that suffering 
you think there is absolutely no possibility of enjoying this world. Have you ever thought like that? Ever been in a situation that's so miserable? Just think, there's absolutely no enjoyment in this world. This is so bad. But that's a very elevated state to think that way. But ordinarily, if things were good, you wouldn't think that way. But because things are bad, you think that way. So Krishna brought you to that realization. Like I told this story before. <clears throat> it's a very funny story. Where one devotee asked Prabhupada to take sannyas and he was married. And Prabhupada said, is it okay with your wife? And he said, yeah, it's okay. And he never asked his wife. He never even told her he asked Prabhupada. And so she found out through the Iskand grapevine, she found out secondhand that, good catch, she found out secondhand that her husband was going to take some yas. So she was devastated and she was really angry. And she had a very close relationship with Prabhupada, so she traveled, got on the train, went to meet Prabhupada. And she said, I'm completely fed up. I just hate everyone, I hate everything. And she's like, you're really, really miserable. And when she's saying that, Prabhupada said, that's really good. He said, because you're like Arjuna, who's just, you know, fed up and surrendered to Krishna. So from the material perspective, we would say, oh, I'm so sorry to hear this. But Prabhupada's coming from another perspective. He said, and he said, he said, oh, you're making spiritual advances because you're fed up with everything. Right? So from our conditioned side, we want everything to be comfortable and everything to go smoothly. Right? But if Krishna sees that if things are too comfortable and too smooth, it could be bad for us, then he'll put some roadblocks. And if we're smart, we'll see, well, I needed those roadblocks. So those roadblocks were mercy then as you advance, Krishna takes the roadblocks away because you don't need them. Because Krishna's desire, according to Vishwanath Chakrabarti, the verse, Ananyas Chitanta Mahamdiya Jana Paribhasate, I carry what you lack. Krishna actually likes to take care of his devotees. He likes to facilitate them. And Krishna would be happy to give us unlimited mercy. He doesn't really want us to put us in situations where we suffer. But it's only when we're detached enough that he can do that, and it won't be detrimental, that he'll do it. And until then, mercy will come in its own way. Krishna may give you a material facility if he knows you can use it well. And it's, not, and it's going to help you. But if it's not going to help you, why would he give it to you? Because it's just going to pull you away. So the more you advance, the more you become detached, the more you become detached, the more Krishna can give you the mercy of the resources to use in his service, and he doesn't have to give the mercy of suffering. Yes? Uh, Vishnu, the Bhagavad Gita explains uh, this passage coming from Dharma, Vaish Dharma, uh, the God of Krishna and Devi, and the Bhagavad Gita coming from Bhagavad Gita. So he said, how do I identify that this passage coming from Dharma and Devi? Uh, and the Krishna direct uh, message. So he was saying that. Or offensive. Any, anything that will. It's just unfortunate if Krishna shows his mercy in if Krishna uses your karma to show mercy because he feels your karma would be helpful and then it takes you away from it. instead of bringing you closer, that would be unfortunate. It's like, you know, the medicine got you sick somehow or other. <clears throat> So, if I have some karma, and Krishna thinks, well, this karma will actually help me. If I get the result of the karma, it will help me. Then he'll let it go through. He'll pass it through, because it will help me. If I take a left turn away from Krishna, and I get slapped in the face, that's good, isn't it? So, 
if my karma is to get slapped in the face when I take a left turn, and if Krishna removes the karma, then how will I learn the lesson? But when I get slapped, it brings me forward. It brings me back to center. And you can see in your life that sometimes when you're thinking a certain way or doing the wrong thing, Krishna will create a situation where you suffer just to say, put your hand in fire, and that's what happens. You forgot when you put your hand in fire, it burns. And I just reminded you. Anyone have that experience? If you, if you, um, if you're, oh, if you bring your awareness to this, you'll start to see it more often. You know, something doesn't work out. You think, why doesn't that work out? And you might realize because I either mistreated a devotee or I did something wrong, and Krishna was just giving me a reaction to show me every time you do this, you suffer. Every time you think this way, every time you try to do this, you suffer. And I will make you suffer until you stop doing that. And that's how I help you, by making you realize that every time you do this, it's not going to work. If it works, you're going to do it again and again. Right? And that will take you away from me. Does that make sense? Yes. So how, how do we understand that? <laughs> He's asking, how do we understand the non-discriminatory nature of mercy? I can explain the way I understand it. I understand it in two ways. Mercy is open to everyone, which means the difference between Krishna's mercy and Lord Chaitanya's mercy is there's more qualification to get Krishna's mercy. Because Krishna in the Gita says, speak this message to devotees. He doesn't even say, speak it to non-devotees. We use that verse to say preaching. But technically, it's to devotees. And technically, a guru will not speak to anyone but a disciple. But that knowledge is only meant for them. So the mercy is very limited. Right? So Lord Chaitanya said, OK, no, you don't have to be a disciple or anything. We just break open the storehouse. Everybody gets it. right? <coughs> But when Prabhupada was asked, why does someone accept it and someone doesn't, he said, on some occasions because they're fortunate, some occasions because they're intelligent. So the accepting has to go there. right? And that acceptance of the mercy means that we would engage in some way in devotional service, either consciously or unconsciously. Take prasadam or come to the temple here, take a book, give a donation, we would do something. And that's our choice, to do it. So we're accepting the mercy. But once we take up the process of sadhana, it changes a little bit. Because at that point, there's, the mercy is always there, but there's more of the earning side of it. And there's more, it's more of being able to receive it, and Krishna, you being a receptacle for it. So that general mercy, yeah, it's there. That we experience in our life. The different devotees are getting mercy to different degrees because of their willingness to surrender. So, you know, a lot of things change. Well, at least they change a little bit when you become a devotee. Like, you're given the holy name and we tell you, Chant Hare Krishna. So you go home and you're on the bus. You know, Hare Krishna, you know. That's Nama Bas. You don't know the ten offenses. You don't even know how to make them. You don't, you know, you're not offending devotees. You don't even know what a devotee is. You're just chanting. So that's Nama Bhas. That's what a Jamal did. It was a Nama Bhas. Now you become a devotee. You're serious sadhana, a sadhaka, and you have to avoid the ten offenses. If you make any of those offenses, now you're in Nama Parad. You, you shoot down from Nama Parad. You start in Nama Bas and you go down. That's the way um, it's explained in Jai Bhadarma. When you begin chanting, you start from Nama Bas. 
And then by committing the ten offenses, then you can go to Nam Aparat. So I think a lot of things in devotional service are like that. Like the entrance fee is low because it's just getting you a like a grandstand seat, but if you want to you know, come down to the lotus feet, you're going to have to pay more. You know, there are prices and things you have to do. So you have to chant offenselessly. You ultimately have to come to shoot or not. Because the goal is high. You're, you're, you're shooting for love of God. In the beginning, you're just disentangling yourself, trying to come to bhajan or kriya. So, as with anything, the higher you want to go, the more you have, the more the higher the price. Right? But I think it's I think it's good that Krishna makes it difficult. And I always personally felt that in Kali Yuga we have a tendency to be lazy, and Krishna only makes it easy at that point you have ruchi because in ruchi you will never be lazy. Even in Nishta, you could become lazy, a little bit, if it's too easy. Well, why? Like in Vrindavan, I become lazy with my japa because it's so good. I don't have to try. It's just I, I love to walk around Vrindavan. Just like completely spaced out, but spaced out of Vrindavan is completely Krishna conscious. Like I don't have to try. There's like no, there's like only Krishna. I like in Vrindavan. I don't know how not to think of Krishna. Even if I try not to think of Krishna, or I could say I don't try not to, but if I don't, even if I don't try to think of Krishna, I do. So it's a Hare Krishna. You know, my rounds are so good. I just like so little effort. They're so good. <clears throat> so that's okay. But as a neophyte devotee, to not make any effort, there, it's not so good because there's not so much ruchi, right? So that Krishna has shown that very clear to me. If he makes it too easy, we'll all get lazy. Like, oh, this is easy. And if at any moment you could chant Shudanam just with a little effort, then you could get lazy and say, well, it doesn't matter if my rounds are bad today because I can chant Shudanam tomorrow. It's easy to chant Shudanam. And then I'll just you know, I didn't study. I didn't study today. I'll study for my test tomorrow. No problem. I'm smart. But some teachers are so difficult. Their tests are so difficult. You can't do that. You have to actually know the subject matter. You can't fake it. So that's what Krishna says. Like you have to do it right, and that's His mercy. Otherwise, we become a little apathetic because that's the nature. A little lazy. And if we become lazy and apathetic, we're not going to get it. And Krishna doesn't just want to give it out so easily. And even in Vrindavan, in Vrindavan, everything is only for Krishna. That's Vrindavan. That the wind blows to give Krishna pleasure. Nothing is there for anything but Krishna's pleasure. And if you're in Vrindavan and you're not 100% there for Krishna's pleasure, you go crazy. You can't stay there. Because it'll amplify all your material desires. You have to be totally for Krishna. So that's part of the mercy of Vrindavan. That if you're not qualified to get the mercy, Krishna will you'll go crazy. You won't, you won't be able to enter into Vrindavan. You'll, you'll want to leave. All right, leave, become, come to Mayapur, get purified, get your visa, become qualified, then go back. It's not a cheap thing. Like Prabhupada used to say, you know, when you go to Vrindavan, you go to do austerity, live simply. No, not, you, know, you don't go to Vrindavan, you know, some people go to Vrindavan to shop and eat. That's not Vrindavan. They're not really in Vrindavan. So you can't, like Prabhupada said, you can't go to Vrindavan by buying a ticket. And the Goswami say, uh, who was it? Narutam das Thakur, Vishaya, Charira, Pave. When I have no desire for sense gratification, then I can see Vrindavan. Because you can't see Vrindavan unless you're totally for Krishna. Then I won't let you see Vrindavan. It's not cheap. 
unless you are pure, your desires for me, it'll be hidden. And then you realize it's not cheap, it's hidden behind my material desire. 